Now, communities have been critical in the fight against HIV and AIDS in Uganda, and Africa's social, culture, and family systems are critical in providing a safety net for those affected by HIV by providing care, treatment, and prevention. Amid the fears of COVID-19 pandemic spreading in two communities, we ask how can we pick lessons from the fight against HIV to prepare ourselves to defeat COVID-19. Now in studio I have Dr. Nelson Musoba, the Director General of the Uganda AIDS Commission, and Jackie Katana, a health advisor to the ambassador of the island of Ireland in Uganda. Good morning and welcome to Morning Again TV. Thank you, Andrew. Well, you for ladies, me. first I'll start with you, Jackie Katana. Kindly bring us to speed. What does the uh, Republic of Ireland uh, do with regards to development features in Uganda? Uh, thank you, Andrew, and mm. good morning, viewers. Mm. Uh, the Embassy of Ireland uh, actually rebranded. That development program was formerly Irish Aid. Uh -huh. So now when you hear Embassy of Ireland, all the development programs are mm. within the embassy. Okay. And we have quite a number of programs. The social protection program through mm -hmm. Minister of Gender, we implemented together uh, with DEFID, mm. the Democratic Governance Facility, uh, mm. DGF with other EU partners. Okay. Then we have the, um, the humanitarian program uh, through UN agencies, mm -hmm. the education implemented by UNICEF and ENABLE, and now the very health program for which we are here, mm. uh, we have mainly HIV and sexual reproductive health. And a bit of system strengthening implemented by joint UN agencies, the 10 of them, Uganda's mm. Commission, and other implementing partners. And then we have a consortia of civil society organizations mm. called Prevention of HIV in Karamoja Communities, wow. led by Straight Talk Foundation. Thank you so much. That, that seems a whole lot of work. <laughs> Dolce yeah. Nelson, this yeah. becomes your support structure yes. through which you can actually deliver. So what lessons can we learn from the containment or um, the fight against HIV and AIDS in communities in context of COVID-19? Now that you are in the real fight against HIV and AIDS. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, the fight against HIV was grounded around partnerships. Mm -hmm working partnerships with the communities, mm. partnerships with the political leadership, okay. partnerships with the development partners, mm. and partnerships, you know, with other agencies like the media f houses, mm. uh, parliament, uh, the private sector, and then people living with HIV, people living with the disease themselves mm. because mm. they are the ones being affected. They are the ones who, you know, will Im be impacted by stigma. And unless you work with them, it becomes very difficult to implement. For oh, instance, yeah. if, the, if the, what you're implementing is not acceptable, mm. if they are not part of the design of the interventions, it will really be hard. So partnerships are key and critical. But besides, there are also structures okay. that uh, HIV AIDS has used that will be the same to serve COVID-19. Like? You know, like the AIDS coordination committees. If you go to the district level, mm. the AIDS coordination committee is chaired by an LC5 chairperson. Mm. The secretary is the chief administrative officer. Mm -hmm. And the department head, civil society, are part of it. Now, if you look at the COVID structure, it's the same. Of the task force. Yeah, yeah. of the task force, it's mm. the same. So there is no reinventing the wheel. The mm. structures are there. The people are there. Mm. It's a question of co-opting them and getting this moving. Okay. Looking at the cultural leaders and, of course, religious leaders, local governments in the fight against COVID-19, um, how can this be leveraged to COVID-19 vis-a-vis the AIDS fight, especially the cultural leaders? Yes. There is a lot of myths about COVID-19 mm -hmm. on the ground. The cultural leaders and the faith-based uh, leaders are key and critical. Mm. If you look at, uh, if we can give the example of the Buganda Kingdom, for instance, oh, yes. the king of Buganda has up to 10 million subjects. Mm. If he passes out word to say, please wear your masks, mm. because wearing masks is a behavior change, and that's the other similarity between uh, HIV and COVID, mm. that a lot of the prevention methodologies are behavior in nature, mm. and they rely on passing a consistent message, mm. and it matters who is carrying the message. So this is where cultural leaders come in. If we mm. give them the messages and they pass these messages to the population, it's going to be very easy for you know, people to implement and, mm. and, and uh, 
and, and therefore prevent the transmission of the infections. Okay. Uh, Jackie uh, Katana, uh, with regards to the development partners, he really loves the development partners because mm -hmm. they make the vision come true. Yeah. What are some of the change dynamics in the fight against COVID-19 which you've seen that have in one way or the other affected your running programs and are these programs going to be affected? Are they going to be on pause or they're still going to go through? Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Mm. Um, just like all the development partners, mm. right, as you said, the Embassy of Ireland, um, since March, uh, mm. when the outbreak or this pandemic was announced in the country, we had to go back to the drawing board mm. because the uh, Minister of Health quickly came up with a COVID-19 um, response plan mm. that had restrictions, that had guidelines, yeah. That means it was not business as usual. Mm. So we had to reprogram and look at, for example, he talked about communities. Mm. Most of the work in order to, to have behavioral change programs running, mm. and then the restriction here says no outreaches, no community, no gathering, no community activities, no gatherings. Yeah. So that means that intervention could not take place until the partners had to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. So we've had to renovate, um, uh, we had to retool mm. and remodel the programming approaches, mm. but it's still building or leveraging on already the community structures that Dr. Msoba talked about. Mm. So if you're working with the religious leaders and you're working with cultural leaders, mm. this time you're not going to gather them or find them in a con congregation because churches are closed. Mm. But how can you facilitate them through innovative ways like media? Mm so that they use the same media to be able to pass on messages. Mm. And communities are very important. We know in Africa, social cultural factors are very important for oh, yes. behavioral change. Mm. It's about the attitude, it's about the mindset. Mm. So um, that is now for community, for health communication, mm. for reaching out. Uh, and we had to integrate. Mm. Like now, most of the program, including Gandhi's Commission and all these UN agencies, most of these interventions are going to be integrated. So it's not going to be, now I'm going to deliver only ARVs, yes. a healthy worker. When mm. I reach there, I also give a message on COVID in terms of sanitation, in terms of psychosocial support, not only for COVID, mm. but also for HIV. Mm. So when I go this time, I don't talk about the client only about HIV. Mm. I'll do psychosocial support. Now addressing the mental and psychosocial support and stigma as well. It's a 360. N yes. Now when it comes to, to access to health, mm. we've had to make sure that partners who work with health facilities like WHO, UNICEF and others, mm. they are able now to, to, to remodel, retool the healthy workers. So they've oh. had to review the guidelines so that those guidelines are integrated with COVID mm. um, aspects. But again, we've had also to incur extra costs because now access to, to, to healthy centers has been very, very challenging. Yes, uh, we've had to, some partners have come to say, okay, now we need transport. You've seen what has been happening to people living with HIV. They could not access treatment. Mm. So partners had to run around to find ways of making sure that drugs are delivered. Oh, yeah. And so we, we, we've had to integrate. We've had to go back and design programs. Mm. But also we've had to add funds. So because now with the, the PPEs and mm. other COVID-specific interventions, mm. uh, some of these we had to add funding to partners you, like WHO. See, Jackie, the challenge here is... Africans, or oh, human by nature, we thrive on people. We thrive on interaction with people and uh, the networks we have, like I come from my home to your home, and we have that kind of interaction. I would really love to know, now that you're passing on a message that is unique and it's different, imagine a health center that was receiving, like, say, a 100 uh, clients a day to come for their drugs and all. Now, here they are. How are we managing the social distancing vis-a-vis the, 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 the number of, 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 uh, of, of officers at that, pass, uh, that health center, let me say health center three, health center four, how are we managing the, the turnover of the people and uh, the big numbers that are coming in? Yeah, right now, <coughs> um, of course, the trends of, of COVID are very dynamic. Mm. At the beginning of, of uh, the pandemic, mm. um, we had very few people access healthy facilities. Mm. And even some of the healthy workers, there was still a struggle whether they should stay and how they should travel back home. Mm. Now, as, as we advance towards where we are today, mm. 
Mm. Now people with transport and a few dynamics and approaches to access healthy facilities out of the outcry of many health challenges that mm -hmm. came as a result of how do we continue healthy service delivery. Now uh, the healthy workers have had to be, that's why I say they had to be trained, mm. but also we recognize that uh, there's going to be workload. Because now with this new pandemic comes with a lot of challenges, mm. a lot of work, it's a very dynamic situation. So which means um, as development partners working with the government of Uganda mm. and all stakeholders, we need to see how do we prepare these healthy workers right. in terms of technical capacity, but also psychosocial, mm. mentally, emotionally, how are they prepared mm -hmm. to handle the workload? To also realize that the context has totally changed. So in the whole healthy sector, Mm. The whole system, both health and community, there's need to reinvent the wheel, there's mm. need to retool, there's mm. need to remodel, there's need to align to the context of COVID-19. The disruption is big, far than we early expected. Now, Doctor, you as one of the person at the helm of the fight against COVID, or rather HIV and AIDS, what best practices can communities um, copy from the fight against HIV and AIDS to apply in the context of COVID-19 so as to, to live within the safety net and not exposing so much to the bigger risk? One of the areas that um, we've you know, struggled with and come a long way as HIV and AIDS is stigma and discrimination, but also understanding you know, what it means to implement uh, the prescribed prevention interventions. Mm. So, and stigma and discrimination ar arises largely out of lack of the full information mm. of how a specific condition is being transmitted. So if you do not have full information, then you will think that uh, either by doing this or the other, I'll get the infection. Mm. So in HIV, we dispelled that through by explaining very clearly how HIV is transmitted. Mm. And the same thing will apply for COVID. What is likely to happen for COVID is that uh, if the community learns mm. that this health facility has a COVID patient, they may not come to have other treatment. Oh, yes, we've seen that in Malabar. Yeah, that yeah. Will, will happen. Mm. And the way to deal with that is to explain to the community that as long as you are wearing your mask, mm. as long as you're keeping the distance, mm. as long as you don't cough in public, Mm. So training the community about how a condition is transmitted is key mm. in minimizing stigma, in minimizing discrimination, but also ensuring that you will continue utilizing services. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you risk people keeping at home and presenting with severe conditions or even dying in communities they can't speak. arising out of the fear that if they go to the health facility, they may, oh, yeah. they may contract the condition from there. We had the situation, the lady who was discharged from uh, Entebbe Grade B Hospital, mm -hmm. she was stigmatized back in her society. Yes. Now, Doctor, Uganda's found challenges and some learning in managing unique populations such as the youth, drug users, sex workers. What lessons does this tell us to come in managing and going over COVID-19, especially the sex workers and the youth are along the borderlines? Mm. It's, it's a bit mm. challenging mm. for the government mm. as well. Now, diseases and infections like HIV and COVID mm. will always go for marginalized populations. True. If you look even statistics from the U.S. and the developed countries, mm. the most affected groups are either the blacks, the immigrants, the Hispanics, Mm. Because when you're on the margins and fringes of society, mm. you're unlikely to be the one who is not immunized. You don't have the means to get transport to seek services. Mm. You wait long with a condition before you report. Mm. And because of that, you're likely to report when you're already very sick. Mm. So the way to deal with that is, and, and yet, is, is to ensure that we support these communities. We give them information because the young people, mm. the sex workers, are looking for a livelihood. Mm. They are trying to look for daily food. They are trying so unless we look out for this population, in in you know uh, interventions like making sure they have access to food, mm. they have access to the very simple minimum livelihoods, mm. then that way we will be cushioning them and protecting them from getting infected. If we don't, then they will become susceptible oh. because by belonging to those age groups and categories, they are already predisposed mm. because in terms of uh, economic empowerment and you know the susceptibilities to, to life circumstances, mm. they're exposed and we need to protect them through that. Mm. Through, you know, 
livelihoods is key in terms of inter intervention. So even just by the country lifting and ensuring that people get back to, to accessing, the new normal. Yeah, to the new normal accessing mm. livelihoods, mm. putting food on the table, it's a form of protection in a way. Okay. Uh, Jackie, your advisor to the embassy that does a lot of work with HIV and AIDS, I really want to understand as, as a journalist, or the nation would like to understand, how have you fared during the lockdown? Uh, thank you. Just like I, I said earlier, mm. HIV, just like other key health essential services, mm. um, had to continue because it's dealing with life. Mm. Uh, definitely we, we had interruptions, mm. but um, we had to make sure that uh, all our partners, they devise means of reaching out to the clients. Mm. We, we had an outcry of treatment. Some people needed to change regiments, others their stocks were out. Mm. So we, we had to work with partners, find ways, but uh, I'll go back to our theme. Mm. And, and that's why it's very, very important to work with communities. Because we had to now go back to the expert clients, okay. the community resource persons, where a healthy worker could not reach at some point. That time they also had not organized themselves. How do we reach out to the yeah. clients? Mm. So the expert clients, the community resource persons, the volunteers, people used their vehicles, people used motorcycles, people walked distances mm. to make sure that these services are not disrupted. Now, when it comes to behavior or prevention, mm. now we had to use social media. Our partners had to use social media. They had to use media. You've mm. seen many of them come and, and give messages Mm. So that uh, use radios in the communities, uh, like most of our work is done in Karamo mm. Karamoja, so they might not be able to access NTV. So you have to go and, and find out which source of media can work. How can we pass on messages? They had to use microphones, the ones we used to use for immunization to mobilize communities. Oh, yeah. Now they are back. That's why we are saying, we, before even we think about new innovations, mm. it's very important to, to also look at what is it that has worked for us in HIV and healthy sector mm. before, and then we build on that, reno innovate. Mm. Because now we realize people had to go back and buy those microphones to go to communities, uh, mm. give them messages where to find services, give them prevention messages, but at the same time give COVID messages. Oh, yeah. So that's how we've been able to fare and work close with the Minister of Health. Mm. Because this pandemic has leadership, it has very clear structures that run from national to subnational. Mm. So all our partners have had to work within the response plan and the structures to make sure that there is a very well coordinated uh, response, both HIV mm. but also aligned to COVID-19 really guidelines. I, I, Thank you. I, I want to, to, to indulge you, given that um, you cover most times um, Karamoja subregion. What are some of the challenges you faced in the fight against HIV and AIDS in these regions? Uh, w when you talk about uh, social cultural mm. <laughs> aspects yeah. in, in communities like Karamoja, that's why you see a real African social context. True. People still live in uh, homesteads. Manyatas. They mm. still manyatas. Mm. They still believe in their elders. Okay. So if, if you come with your technical message and you think you're going to pass it on and say this is how HIV spreads, this is how you can take treatment, this is COVID, they will not mm. understand what COVID is. Mm. If it's coming from a person like <coughs> me and you, mm. they need to hear their elders. They need to hear their religious leaders. Mm. They need to be able to, to, to align to the context of Karamoja. It's very unique. It's very isolated. Uh, it's very far from services, even service delivery. Thank God for the partners and the government of Uganda. Now at least we have good coverage in terms of health facilities, but they say a lot. Okay. Healthy workers, very few healthy workers really uh, appreciate working in Karamoja. So take in terms of uh, human resources for health, mm. is you have to go an extra mile. So th there are many challenges that uh, and poverty. Okay. You know, it's one of, of the areas that are really hit hard and drought yeah. and food security. But when it gets to poverty, yesterday in the Daily Monitor, uh, it was on page six, um, part of the factors that are leading to the school dropout, especially the girl child dropping out, one of them was poverty. It was highlighted to other factors that go hand in hand with reproductive health challenges, of, especially for the girl child. 
In the wake of COVID-19 and HIV and AIDS at the same wavelength, still in the region, how is the girl child, how have you amplified the society to protect the girl child, to share this information that, look, um, it's natural to menstruate, it's, it's very key for you to not have a child because uh, the research was showing that as soon as they go into their periods, uh, they think, they tell them you're now an adult mm. and she's just 13. In the context of that, in the wake of COVID-19, where social distancing, of course, is being emphasized, but the girl child in this wave, how have you passed on the message that they stay safe? Um, reproductive health, especially adolescent health, has yes. been uh, highly affected mm. by COVID-19. Um, it has taken us back. We, we had reached a level together with partners where we had sensitized communities, uh, the leaders in the mm. community, and we were able to identify uh, the peer educators, people, mm. the young people who can be able to reach out to them. Okay. And, but now, uh, the social cultural aspects of in Karamoja are still very, very key, mm. despite the work that has been done. Mm. Now, where you have a lockdown and people are back to their manyatas, mm. to their homesteads, to their parents, mm. with no mm. access to services, with no access to information. Mm. We've registered, we, we are carrying out an assessment mm. like, uh, to see how we've been affected. But w from the records that we are getting from communities and healthy facilities, we can clearly tell that uh, we are naked to register increased uh, teenage pregnancy, right. there are forced and early marriages, mm. And some of them are again out of the context of poverty and food security. Oh, yeah. You must survive. You're knocked down here. Mm. You don't have food. And there's someone who is willing to offer mm. um, an income, survival for a day. Mm. But also access to youth-friendly services. Oh, yeah. uh, what, where we've worked with our young people and our communities, we've realized that most of the young people are not uh, open to talk to their community leaders. Uh, to their parents when it comes to accessing uh, some of these key services. Mm. So they've been going to youth-friendly services where they meet uh, yeah. other young people to get more information. But now those ones access, because there's no transport, they cannot access the services. Mm. So we are going to register a uh, very high uh, level wow. sexual reproductive and uh, adolescent healthy uh, challenges and mm. the statistics are likely to hike. And that's why, as I said, uh, these are some of the things that we are reviewing. Mm. As we do HIV, it's not going to be only a district AIDS committee mm. that is focusing on HIV. No, that, that the context has two. changed. Mm. It's going to, to focus on the emerging challenges as a result of COVID, mm. but also addressing COVID as well. So the, the approaches have to shift. Have totally changed. Yeah. It's a big disruption. Doctor... How has the Uganda AIDS Commission uh, helped in coordinating the different players, in, especially in these critical times, such as access to health care, treatments, and all that? A friend of mine on, on Twitter here sent me, is in, in Buyikwe, uh, a place called uh, Se, Se, Sedi Island. Um, the water levels went up. They submerged the entire place. Now they can't access ARVs, and their three-month stockpile is done. What have you been doing to make sure that these people stay with their meds and they can still have access to services? Uh, thank you, Andrew. This is where we fell back onto the strength of our partnerships and communities. Mm. The people living with HIV have a structure at national level. It's called the National Forum of People Living with HIV. Mm. And they have district, uh, district branches. So in addition to the government uh, mechanisms that had been put in place. Mm -hmm. Because the guidance for the district task forces were that um, uh, prioritize uh, essential services, mm. allow those seeking s health services to go. If they need transport, you know, give it to them. But mm. those were stretched, those services were stretched across. Mm. And this group fell in as volunteers, and a lot of them have been moving, you know. Also because of stigma, the earlier question you asked. Yeah. Very often people living with HIV are not willing to come up to anybody mm. to say, because when you say, I want to travel, they would be asked, why do you want to travel? Mm. And they have never exposed their condition mm. yeah. that they are living with to the local authorities. Mm. But they are only willing to open up to fellow people living with HIV. Mm. So it became very essential, and they would pick the pills for them, take mm. them back for refill. So unless it was really essential for them to travel, 
that is how these uh, key groups came up to, to cover the gap. So okay. it was such an essential bridge between, uh, you know, the health facility mm. and the person living with HIV in the community. Okay. Yes. So going forward, people in islands, what strategy do we have for them? What plan do we have for them? Because they are watching and they would love to know what's... Because you're from the AIDS Commission, we have the right person to give us hope. Uh, people from the islands, let's use our leaders, you know, mm. let's work with uh, uh, the district uh, health officer, the HIV focal person. Mm. Uh, the Minister for Presidents has directed mm. all resident district commissioners throughout the country mm. to prioritize, uh, you know, access to health services by people living with HIV, mm. allow them to go out and refill. I know that the Minister of Health has sent instructions to the national medical stores mm. to ensure that, you know, they look at their, how they are delivering medicines to the mm. health centers. They usually have, uh, you know, cycles through which they deliver services to the lower level oh, yeah. and prioritizing HIV and AIDS as much as possible. So it is reinforcing the mechanisms that we've been having to ensure that, because we do not want tomorrow when COVID ends, for us to find that the level of new HIV infections have gone, gone up. up. It will be a disaster. Now, th that is the worrying bit. Um, <clears throat> when the lockdown was announced, everyone was running up and down. Some people were held up, maybe their boyfriends, especially the youth. And um, we have had incidences where even some shops and um, some clinics were locked up. How are we holding this post-COVID-19? Are we going to go into a mass... Uh, reawakening of the sensitization are we going to go back to the abc campaign what should we look up for from um, the uganda aids commission with regards to hiv and aids because believe you me there has been reckless behaviors on the ground no, that's that's true and that is why during this month of may mm. we've been on an hiv awareness campaign Mm. If you remember, a few uh, two weeks ago, the Archbishop of uh, the Church of Uganda, mm. the Right Reverend uh, Dr. Stephen Mugalu, came out. He told people that even within the lockdown, please be aware that yes. HIV AIDS is still with us. Mm. Practice uh, safety mechanisms. And unfortunately, HIV is not as dramatic on the onset mm. as maybe the other conditions. So be aware that uh, every time, you know, Avoid, uh, be, you know, unless it is the right time, mm. avoid uh, having sex, but uh, until the right time. Mm. And if you must have it, be faithful to your partner. Mm. And uh, if you must have it with somebody whose uh, status you do not know, use a condom. Or if you're discordant with your partner, also use a condom. So the ABC still applies mm. as much as it used to in the past. Mm. And for those who test and find that they're HIV positive, the medicines are available, they can go on and start on medication immediately. We had a story we ran here uh, where one of, um, one of your clients usually travels from Arua to get the drugs from another district mm -hmm. for fear of society stigmatization mm -hmm. and the likes. And he says that now in the wake of COVID-19, he had to get the drugs from his district. Mm -hmm. This exposed him to the to his district peers and they now know that he's actually HIV positive and he's very uncomfortable. Do we have programs to reinforce and re-empower such people in communities where they have now been exposed by COVID-19 and a couple of them on Twitter, they say, oh, now I know who has what and all <laughs> that. So how do they navigate through this? Now, Uganda's commission has developed uh, uh, an anti-stigma and discrimination policy. Mm. And we've recently, we've started uh, disseminating it. Now, this policy has certain roles and responsibilities it gives to uh, the, the, the users or clients. Mm. And one of them is self-empowerment. Come out and challenge anybody who is trying to stigmatize you. Mm. You know, HIV is like any other condition. Mm. In fact, it's so freeing for you to come out. When you speak to people who are openly living with HIV, like Dr. Stephen Watiti, oh, yeah. like Major Rubara Miraranga, yeah. and others, they, are, they feel so free, they feel so empowered, mm. they will tell you they look so healthy, more healthy than even people who <laughs> don't have HIV. Indeed. Mm. So it's so empowering. A lot of stigma is internal stigma, or mm. what they call self-stigma. Yeah. Mm. But we, are, we encourage people living with HIV, and if you look, young people now have an association mm. of young positives living with HIV. Some even of them are even organizing beauty pigeons. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. Yeah, and that's yeah. so freeing. So it may 
feel inconveniencing and uh, and uh, and uncomfortable to come out mm. of course it has implications not just on you but your family members your children in school mm. but it's also very empowering so we are out on a campaign to empower individuals to make sure that to train them to give them skills on how mm. to come out how to challenge somebody who is trying to stigmatize them mm. and ensure that because living freely also increases the other population to protect themselves yeah. to know that this thing is real, it is here with us, and it's mm. people, you know, no more people like you and me who can have HIV. It's not some strange group there oh, yeah. who, who are careless or something. Well, looking at all these, um, the people living with HIV and AIDS in the initial stages of the lockdown, many say they were vulnerable. Um, and uh, there were myths going all over social media that if you're with HIV and AIDS, you're more prone uh, to, 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 to be taken over by COVID-19. But uh, thankful uh, to the Ministry of Health, it came out, it disputed that. Mm. But to re-echo that to them, now that you, you're from the Commission, how strong should they know that it's, it's, it's not because they have HIV and AIDS that they're very vulnerable, mm. but just like any other person, they could actually uh, get infected? Yeah, the, you know, the, when you're protecting yourself, you first assume mm. that you're the only one who doesn't have it. You're the mm. only one without COVID. Mm. So protect yourself from COVID and then protect your neighbor. Mm. Because we've seen uh, statistics from elsewhere. Leaders, we know mm. the Prime Minister of UK got yeah. COVID. Oh, yes. He's, he's not some you know, weak person. As well. And we know, mm. you know, we, we've been seeing the news trickling in. So anybody is mm. vulnerable to getting these conditions, whether it is HIV, mm. whether it is COVID. So when you're laying out uh, your protection measures, uh, first protect yourself mm. and then protect your neighbor and just practice that. Uh, it is not that... Uh, while it may be true that if you have an underlying condition, you may mm. be more susceptible, oh but yeah. anybody else is susceptible, as we've seen from the statistics elsewhere. Oh yes. So, Jackie, going forward, post-COVID-19, what should we expect from the development partners, given that there has been retooling, the skill sets have changed, a lot of approaches and programs have been um, remodeled? What should you expect from the island embassy? Yeah, what I can say is that... Um Development partners will continue mm. to work with the government of Uganda and other key partners mm. or key actors. Uh, they will continue to work closely uh, with the policy formulation and guidelines uh, departments to make sure that all these guidelines mm. are aligned to Ministry of Health response plan. Mm. But uh, of course also partners are mobilizing resources uh, from their governments, from their sources of funding, mm. because uh, COVID-19 comes with a lot of challenges. Okay. Um, we did not talk much, but when we said the restrictions, the guidelines, we, we, we packed it up. Mm. But for example, if you look at the logistics involved mm. in, in management of COVID-19, the laboratory, it's, it's a lot of money that is required. Mm. All these testings we, we see, if we went and took calculating how much is involved in only one person being tested, mm. there are lots of resources that are required. But also um, the, the PPEs, uh, the protective equipment, mm. these sanitizers, washing facilities, uh, these masks, mm. these are not of resources that is required. So partners are working very closely with the government of Uganda mm. and other actors to make sure that those key aspects, there are those that can wait. But there are those where you must save life. Mm. You know, where, where in health, when you're, you're drawing an approach, there's what can wait uh, uh, for a minute, but there's mm. when if you don't do it now, then it's just like in HIV. Mm. If someone is infected, oh, then, oh, yeah, mm. is infected, mm. uh, you're, you're not going to reverse. You'd rather quickly move in and mm. make sure that the person is not infected. The same with COVID. Oh, yeah. So we, we, are, we are working together to align the, the guidelines, come up with approaches, but also mobilize resources mm. and leverage on each other. We, we Partners don't work independently. Oh, yes. we, we work together. We are able to map and look who is supporting what and then what else, where is the gap. Mm. We, are, we are inviting and meeting Ministry of Health all the time to find out where are the needs and the gaps uh, so that we see how we can, we can work together and support the response. Mm. But very important, 
we are ensuring that there is continuity, effective and efficient continuity of health essential services. That's the because key. the situation might not be reversed, as you already said. Mm. So we have to continue, mm. but also we have to address emerging issues of wow. COVID-19. That is uh, the island embassy uh, working together with development partners to make sure that we stay safe and sound. Are the projects uh, regards to reproductive health and health stay in touch? but as well as COVID-19 being addressed. Um, uh, Dr. Msoba, as we're winding up, what should we expect post-COVID-19 from the AIDS Commission? Uh, again, the AIDS Commission is, we are giving a message to our partners mm. that um, COVID will have a lasting impact on the way we do business. Mm. So we are also saying, let's integrate we are telling, you know, the communities, the local governments, that mm. as you go out, uh, address HIV and, and, and address COVID at the same time. Mm. These committees, as they take out the messages, you should take out, you know, both messages at the same time. Mm. Uh, but continue to maintain the instructions and directives. We, can't, we shouldn't sit back saying when the COVID gets lifted, then we shall eventually go back to HIV prevention. That time may not come very quickly, so mm. let's continue moving. Let's adapt to new ways. We are now doing, you know, virtual meetings, transmitting mm. our messages through media, TV, mm. and radios mm. as much as possible. And uh, we have to continue working and integrating uh, interventions uh, going forward. Well, we'll take a break for now. Uh, it's a conversation I just don't want to let go because it's entirely about health. We'll take a break and be back shortly. You're watching Morning at NTV. Morning at NTV. I'm Andrew Chamagero, and we are live from Kampala Serena Conference Center. Now, today is day two of the race, the lockdown. It seems to be a mess on the road, but I don't want to leave you in the wishful world. Connecting to our colleague Stephen Mbide in Kalere. Stephen, what is the situation like on the road? Andrew, on ordinary days around this time of 8 a.m. here at the, at the Kaleri roundabout here, if you are driving from the other side of Namungona and Waise, you literally find no big congestion like it is just now. But from at this particular moment, as you're driving from the roundabout of Waise, just be sure that you're going to be uh, finding this bumper to bumper flow of traffic jam uh, heading towards this roundabout of Kaleri, but be sure that you just keep driving and no worries for now uh, even when you find the traffic officers around this place that are trying their level best to clear the congestion at least before they came here i uh, was here from uh, around exactly 8 a.m i saw here there was a lot of congestion before these traffic officers uh, came around this place to clear the flow uh, especially for those those people heading towards the Gayaza Road, they were having a lot of congestion. But for now, a less of congestion. There is also the Roadworks by Motor Angel Company that is working on the northern extension of the northern bypass here. These guys are on ground already. They are trying to enlarge or extend this northern bypass so that uh, really the flow of traffic is really is as we move ahead. And uh, if you see the the vehicles there on your screen are those ones coming from the direction of uh, Gayaza Road, areas like Imperi Airway, uh, Kasangati and beyond as you move towards this roundabout of Kaleri and less of congestion. Save for you who is on foot, you find your colleagues who are moving and remember to put on the mask because you will not be allowed to cross beyond one day. I was there in the previous hour and I saw uh, officers there, they are stopping for whoever is moving on the road trying to access the city, whether you're a motorbike, a motorcyclist, or you are a pedestrian, you have to put on a mask. And remember, uh, still the same rule, you have to be carrying not more than two other people apart from you, the driver. Uh, this is the situation here. It's uh, almost busy as we move towards the other side of Kaleri Market. Uh, from Kaleri Market, going towards the Kubidi roundabout there, we could almost uh, lose there between 10 and 15 minutes. It's very busy, a uh, flow of traffic that side. But uh, continuing towards the other side of Wandegia traffic lights, less of congestion. You just continue uh, driving. And coming from Wandegia, coming towards this roundabout, you still uh, keep driving, no much interference. For you who is heading towards that side of Ntinda, 
using the northern bypass are still for you and there is clear flow of traffic so you better use this other side if you're around any of the areas that are surrounding the northern bypass not much trouble uh, for this particular morning save uh, for you who is coming from beyond the other side of Gayaza, you will just be finding some congestion heading towards the, this roundabout here. This is what I can update you for now from this other side of the city, Andrew Chiamagiro. You can take it over from me. But today is a special day in my life. On um, this day, 27th of May, um, Foster Navasirka, that is my dear mother, oh. walked into um, <laughs> Zambia Hospital and before noon, she was, oh. she was also, uh, the doctors there announced that she had given birth to a baby, baby boy, boy. And that baby boy, she named her Stephen Mbide oh, with dear. my father. I <laughs> have to say, uh, Happy birthday I'm so to you. grateful to you, my dear mother, Foster Navasaruka, for giving, giving birth to me. Oh, I dear. always be grateful for you. I also know that my colleague there, the yes. side language interpreter, yes. Maureen Nambalirwa, you've always been seeing her here it's at amazing. 9 p.m. NTV Tonight and other programs, just giving you, relaying uh, those sign language interpretations happy. there. Maureen Nambalirwa, happy birthday to you. We share the birthday, the birthday together oh, and dear. think we can share the birthday <laughs> today. Back to you, Andrew uh, Chiamagero. And I will, for now, I'll enjoy my day. Okay. It's a special day in my life. Happy birthday, Stephen Mbide and Maureen Nambal. You know, the challenges are we are going to celebrate your birthdays in a scientific way. But all we can assure you is that we wish you the best of luck and more to more to more blessings and prosperous uh, new age there. Well, it's, it's a great day. My colleagues are making um, great strides there. Still on set with me, I still have, of course, uh, Dr. Nelson Musoba, the Exec Director General, Uganda AIDS Commission, and Jackie Katina, a healthy advisor to the Ambassador of Violent in Uganda. Dr. Nelson, there was a research about HIV and AIDS in Karamoja subregion. Kindly indulge us about this research. Um. Uh, we had a rapid uh, assessment mm. uh, actually carried out uh, uh, in collaboration with our partners, mm. UNAIDS and the National Forum of People Living with HIV. Mm. And it went out, you know, specifically during this COVID period to see how is COVID impacting on people living with HIV. Yeah, yes. And uh, indeed it looked and found that um, up to 68% mm. of the people who were surveyed had refills of ARVs that would last them only two months or less. Oh. And 23% of the groups that were surveyed had children in the households who were on ARVs. But it generally it was looking at the risk profiles of these yeah. homes mm. and uh, a good percentage, you know, had needed to have their, they had refills of less than a month and they needed to have this refilled. So based on that, that is how the strategy is working with partners who are put in place mm. to ensure that how do we make sure that these people do not run out of refills mm. because uh, a person living with HIV, once you've started on treatment, you're not supposed to stop. Yeah. If you stop, you'll get, uh, you know, if you get a disruption, then uh, the viral load will come up, you risk reinfecting your partner, but mm. also you yourself falling sick and uh, also developing resistance because... Mm. Uh, the same medication may not work on you if you are not adherent to the way you're taking it. Okay. So this study was done both for Karamoja but also other parts of the country mm. and it's being used to, to inform how uh, the people living with HIV are supported mm. and helped you know, to minimize disruption but mm. also help them access services. Well, Jackie, uh, I understand you're part of the partners who carried out this research. Part of the key things I'm having here is access to food. How are these clients getting food, and how are they holding up with regards to basic, you know, basic needs here? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, the, actually, the, the research was very loud and clear mm. on the needs, uh, nutritional needs of people living with HIV. Mm. Uh, already, you can see in, in the general population, the citizens of Uganda are crying out for food. Mm. <laughs> so, if someone is already on treatment, their nutritional needs triple or are more. Mm. Uh, so even when we've been uh, implementing comprehensive programs, mm. for the Embassy of Ireland, we've worked with WFP, World Food Program, and uh, FAO, Food Agriculture Organization, the mm. two agencies, in terms of nutritional support. Mm. 
Mm. But that is only for Karamoja region and okay. for for mothers mm. uh, on elimination of mother to child program, mm. EMTCT, but not for people living with HIV per se. Okay. We've tried to work with UN women to make sure that we multiply the incomes, the food security of mm. some of, of, of the, the clients. But still that's a drop in the ocean. So what is coming out very clearly, mm. and actually what COVID-19 has exposed and brought to reality, mm. is special attention and the need for nutritional support, not only nutrition in terms of the diet and mm. calories, mm. but food security for people living with HIV. Oh, yeah. So I, I would say for now it's among the many interventions, mm. but there is need to give it special focus in programming. So it did your needs and others mm. and Nafano and all these partners right now that's the need and that's mm. what even we are saying. For example we are asking mm. uh, how does the Prime Minister's office, there's what partners can do yeah. and on that one we've tried to integrate it in our programs but I said that's a drop in the ocean. Mm. So when we went to Minister of Health and, and said there's a need here, Minister of Health referred us to Prime Minister's office mm. and that, that's what we are trying. Now we are trying to engage and that's why my sectoral approach is very important to, to not only HIV but even COVID. Yes. How does all these sectors work together? Mm. So Prime Minister's office should be able to look at the special needs. Mm. For example, people living with HIV. Mm. Uh, you talked about adolescents before yeah. someone gets uh, pregnant because someone has given them just Food. a donut. Mm. Uh, or has been given uh, 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 a thousand shillings to mm. go and buy pads. Mm. How do we come in to look at the special groups, mm. the special needs of the clients, of the people in our community, so that we, we, we look at, uh, again, it takes us back to HIV uh, models that models, we can replicate, yes. the, the diversified mm. model, where you're able to look at the special needs mm. of individuals. If someone cannot come at a healthy facility, how do you reach them? Oh, yes. If someone that needs this food, but their need is not a uh, refill of stockouts. How do you now address the food? Mm. So there is need for a sectoral approach, but mm. we are calling out to Prime Minister's office mm. to work with all of us and the Minister of Health to mm. address nutritional needs of people living with HIV. Mm. Because treatment without nutrition is equally suicide. Wow. Doctor, you want to re-echo something about the food access to food for the clients? Yes, indeed. Uh, when this came up, uh, again... Uh, through the Minister for Presidency, Honorable mm. Estambayo. Mm. We reached out to the chair of the National Task Force. Mm. Uh, she has appealed to the Office of the Prime Minister to you know, direct the district task <coughs> forces to ensure mm. that this specific category is prioritized mm. in terms of, of, of you know, access to food. Okay. Because it's critical, like she said, you can't swallow ARVs unless you have food. Mm. And, and that is, uh, that is uh, but also as communities, let's ensure that where we are, we, we live the, the African way and in addition to the government interventions, mm. let's look out for our neighbor and ensure that, you know, we, we don't let them go mm. without food. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jackie, what be, how best can the Ministry of Health bring up their best game with regards to COVID-19 vis-a-vis the HIV and AIDS fight? Um, there are key aspects. Uh, mm. uh, one, I already mentioned it, it's mm. very important to look at multi-sectoral approach. Mm. Uh, because this is not only Ministry of Health. Yes. COVID is, is multi-sectoral. Yes, everyone is involved. So if we look at that even in terms of resources, mm. leveraging on different resources in different sectors, it will be easy to address. Mm. The other one is coordination. How, how do we coordinate with development partners? How does government, uh, Minister of Health, uh, with actors, not only healthy development partners, but also other partners, as I said, there are those mm. that are dealing with gender. Gender-based violence is an issue. Uh, there are those who are dealing with uh, food, uh, food uh, mm. security. So how do we coordinate all those partners, but also coordinate the structures? Yes. You see, COVID-19 has come with its own structure, right from national. Mm. The task forces, the committees, but also remember we have other structures right. that uh, existed before. Mm. So how do these structures merge? merge? Mm. But also now not only the, 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 the government structures, mm. but also the community structures. So there's a need for a lot of, in order to up the game, mm. 
Mm. There's need to, to coordinate the structures. There's need to enhance the mass central approach. But above all, it's very important to leverage on, on our existing approaches and opportunities mm. so that we don't re over reno re renovate the mm. wheel, but we don't become over-innovative and we cannot be able to sustain the efforts. Oh, yes. Because it's going to end up being very, <coughs> very expensive. Mm. And, and as a country, our resource basket uh, might not be to, to able to sustain it. So mm. it's very important. And I'll conclude by what the uh, doctor said. Again, let's not look at only the, the relief food. Mm. Let's continue encouraging people. The rains are here, mm. despite the floods. There are those that are not flooding. So how can they continue with agriculture? So that we don't say, okay, now it's time to get uh, free food, relief food. I need mm. milk. I need honey. I need... Uh, <laughs> how do we again continue with what we've been doing? Only other actors <coughs> and the government <coughs> comes in. Mm. But uh, also... I would say it's very important for Minister of Health to review the guidelines for continuity mm -hmm. of delivery of health essential services, okay. especially on the component of the guidelines that restrict community activities mm -hmm. like outreaches. Because uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, the guidelines, it was very important that they close off mm -hmm. activities in communities, mm -hmm. gatherings, meetings. Mm -hmm. But now, as we continue to ease, can, can we get a guidelines review so that they give guidelines for messages, for healthy mm. communication? How do we go? I'm not saying that they, they open up, but mm. I'm saying if people are put on masks and there's one-on-one -on -one and they do distancing, a message goes on. Mm. Even all these approaches we are talking about, media and others, mm. can they go in those guidelines? So that even the local leaders, uh, the community leaders we are talking about are very clear in mm. terms of the community approaches so that mm. messages and uh, service uh, delivery relying. continues. Dr. Nelson, yes. when it goes to opening up, how best can everyone get involved in the fight against COVID-19? She has tried to bring it, but it's a little bit much more technical mm. with the powers that be, the management bit of it. But how do we get everyone involved mm. from the grassroots to the national level? Okay, so as we open up, first of all, the risks of, of opening up are there that if we open up without taking care, mm. COVID can flare up. And uh, if you look at the numbers from a number of countries which have opened <coughs> up, you know, mm. if you look at the numbers from Nigeria. Yesterday when we opened up, we registered 31 cases. Yes, if you look at the numbers from Ghana, mm. from Egypt. So we really need to, to prepare for this. Mm. And the way to prepare for this is to emphasize communicating the behavior change interventions, repeated messaging, mm. because uh, the prevention messages for COVID <coughs> are about behavior change. Mm. And we are going to have to change the behavior. We can't, you know, as we are social beings, we love shaking hands, mm. we love hugs, mm. we love being in close communities, mm. but that can't happen for our own good. So oh, yeah. that message must be core, but also let's decentralize that to every entity. Mm. What we did for HIV was that um, the guidelines for each institution is you have to have a focal person for mm. HIV, you have a committee, mm. then they have guidelines and they implement those guidelines. We need to adopt the same approach oh. because this can't be centralized to be managed from the Minister of Health. It won't mm. work. We just, it will be outstretched. Yeah. So the Minister of Health needs to make sure that, uh, you know, the institutions, the different ministries, the media houses, mm. they own the guidelines and they have a person who routinely looks at to make sure that the guidelines are being implemented yeah. mm. and, and supervised. That way, we will decentralize the ownership. Mm. Institutions and individuals will own this process. Mm. They will know that it's for their own good. Mm. And then they will start taking on these behaviors and practicing them. And that way, we will block the spread of the disease. Well, you have it, Jackie, as we're winding up. Your last one today. Yeah, m uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Mm. And um, we are very grateful. Mm. Uh, I will say COVID-19 is going to be here. And uh, we appreciate the government of Uganda and all the stakeholders mm. for the actions that have been taken. Even with rising numbers, mm. out of truck drivers and other forces, we <coughs> are beginning to register community cases. Mm. But at least we've not had death cases. Yes. So that, that shows that the response plan has been implemented. In time, yes. So my final word is that uh, let's continue to work together. Mm. 
Mm. It's very important to collaborate, mm. uh, to coordinate, but also tailor the messages and our services to appropriate mm. strategies that our communities will be able to adopt and mm. own. Because if we, if we make it um, very artificial, very scientific, then the communities will say, okay, COVID is not for us. Oh, yes. But if we, we go back, <coughs> like where, what we did with HIV and, and other healthy uh, infectious diseases, um, they, everyone gets to know it's my responsibility and I have a role to play. Oh, yeah. So let's continue to integrate it. Let's continue to use the resources we have efficiently and effectively mm. by leveraging on what we are doing, but also integrating our services. Thank you so much. That is Jackie Katana, Health Advisor to the Ambassador of Ireland in Uganda. Uh, Dr. Nelson Musoba, the Director General uh, of Uganda AIDS Commission, what could be your last words on this program today? Uh, my last word <coughs> to our viewers is that um, as Ugandans, mm. we've been victorious before, you know, on, 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 uh, on the war against HIV. We can also be victorious for this one. Uh, it is for our own uh, health and safety and please remember that even as we fight COVID mm. there are other conditions out there that still exist HIV still exists the young people the risk of uh, you know other STDs the risk of unwanted pregnancies is still out there so let let's take caution let's exercise you know the the what we've been taught and we stay safe avoid COVID and we avoid HIV and other conditions. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this conversation. Thank you for those who have been a part of this conversation online. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much, Jackie. You. you can be a part of this conversation. Please follow their Instagram, rather their Twitter handles, where they can be in position to give you back responses to those questions possibly we could have missed in this conversation. But it was a celebrating in Bide and Maureen uh, Nambaira's birthday today. Couple of you today, it's your birthday. Rahim uh, Ali says, Happy birthday, Helen Johnson. That's on Facebook. Tumukunde Betty says, It's her birthday. Happy birthday. Kimberly Babi, happy birthday. Sa Apollo Wamoto, happy birthday. And Anyango Sarah, happy birthday to your pretty baby making six years today. Happy birthday. I'm Andrew Chamagero, and shortly after me, much more exciting programming follows. Remember to follow NTV on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's NTV Uganda. And shortly after us, Farida Nakazwe is coming with Mwasuze Mutia. Good morning.